Feeling kind of left out at work on Monday morning? Check out The Barf, breaking news, acquisitions, research, and funding. It's a look back at the week that was so you can prepare for the week that is. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Hello, everyone. This is Bob Pulver. Welcome back to the Elevate Your AIQ podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by my friend Richard Rosenau from One Model. Richard and I discuss people analytics, talent intelligence, the integration of AI and HR, emphasizing the importance of upskilling, responsible AI practices, and the evolving definition of the workforce. We highlight the need for HR to proactively embrace AI to improve productivity and decision making while addressing challenges like data hygiene and bias. The conversation underscores the growing demand for AI talent and the future of HR tech involving AI-driven workflows, or what we call agentic workflows, which we anticipate will drive significant value and innovation. Stick around to hear Richard's insights on how to best elevate one's AIQ, and I hope you enjoy this discussion. Thanks for listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Elevate Your AIQ. I'm your host, Bob Pulver. With me today is my friend, Richard Rosenau. Hey, Richard. Good to see you, Bob. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, spending some time with me and uh, for our audience. There's, oh my God, there's so much to talk about. You and I never have shortage of topics. And, um, but I thought we could just kick off with just you just giving a bit of background about uh, what you've been up to, how you wound up where you are at, at One Model and some of the uh, extracurriculars that I know you help others with, like finding jobs in people operations and people analytics. Absolutely. No, I'd be happy to. Uh, it's, yeah, always good to see you, Bob. Always good to catch up. Uh, so my background, so I, uh, way back when sociology got interested in like, how do people come together? Why do people come together? And I've really been chasing that my whole career. Uh, had an early career in nonprofit, quickly found my way to people analytics space and got to see some of the like world's best people analytics teams. Uh, so I got to see GE Capital, got to see uh, Facebook, Uber, Nike, Argo AI, and um, really learned a lot about a lot of different teams. So got to see kind of like early workforce planning at GE, got to see Facebook's team go from 15 to 150. I uh, got to lead teams at kind of Uber, Nike, and Argo, and um, really with a big focus on kind of data and data platforms. That's always been an excitement for me in a space I really enjoyed. Uh, so this role opened up here over here at One Model. Uh, so I'm our VP of People Analytics Strategy, and that's a bit of a funny title. It's uh, it's one that I think my MBA program loves because I've got analytics and strategy. What's not to love? But I do I do a lot of different things over here. So I, I work horizontally. I get to talk to everybody about kind of what's going on in people analytics, uh, but bringing that into the inside of the company. And then externally, I do a lot of our research, uh, a lot of our community connections, and I get to talk about people analytics day in, day out. And that makes me very happy and thrilled to be here with you today, Bob. Excellent. Excellent. No, that's great. I think one of the, you know, as I myself pivoted into the sort of talent um, space, certainly part of that impetus was because I saw so much opportunity in this space and Obviously, had to quickly learn a lot of different terminology, uh, talent intelligence, people analytics, workforce analytics. What are all these different sort of sub you know disciplines, and why aren't more companies investing in in some of these areas? Why aren't some of these teams working collabor- more collaboratively together? And I think today I still ask those questions. Yeah, I think you've posted about this, you know, talent these definitions, and without without getting into sort of terminology debates necessarily. When you think about that landscape around, you know, talent intelligence, people analytics, uh, looking outside, looking inside, uh, and how these things sort of crisscross, can you give us like a, a TLDR, you know, sort of version of where you see all that? Oh, totally. Yeah, I think it's funny because like anyone coming into the space new, I think that's the first battle they have to deal with is just like, what is everyone saying and why are they saying different things? And that's, but that's part of like a, a decentralized movement. Is like we don't have like a FINRA or governing body. We have a lot of people trying to figure this out and doing their best. And because of that, we have a lot of different ways that people kind of came to this space. So I, I think I'm pretty laid back when it comes to the like people analytics, workforce analytics, HR analytics, talent analytics, like a lot of that terminology. I think a lot of that is either nonsense or has a particular reason, but coalescing around people analytics has been healthy, I think. And we've seen a lot of that in the past couple of years where it tends to be a little bit more heavy in that direction. I think that we have seen talent intelligence really start to pull away. I think in no small part to Toby Kolsch has done a phenomenal job with the talent intelligence collective. I mean, he's got a book on talent intelligence, just all all the love for Toby, what he does. 
But I think when we start to think about those, I remember somebody telling me, well, they're the same thing, aren't they? And I'm like, at some point, words have to mean something. And, and I think a lot about analytics and intelligence in particular. When I think about analytics, I think about with the data we have, let's make a decision. When I think about intelligence, I think about let's gather the information about the world and bring it back. I think a lot of people have still have their own debates about that, but that's, that's how in my mind those two slot together really, really well is talent intelligence. People in analytics teams need talent intelligence teams to bring them the information and get them the data and acquire that and bring, bring that back to make sense of it. I think some other people do internal, external, and there, there's a, still some debate on that too. But uh, at the end of the day, I'd say give yourself some grace if you're trying to figure out what these mean. It's, it's confusing right now. You know, how those teams even formed at the beginning may have guided, you know, how much of each, like you said, some of it's really about intelligence gathering and, and sort of uh, calling through a lot of that data and making, making sense of it, as opposed to doing, you know, interrogating the data yourself, getting your hands dirty, so to speak, manipulating the data, doing scenarios and looking at those large data sets across, especially a big organization. So I think uh, that has guided, you know, and maybe bifurcated some of the the pools of, of where people are, are focusing. I guess the way I think about it nowadays, and I admit I'm doing a little bit of sort of Monday morning you know, quarterbacking here since I didn't grow up in HR or analytics, but it just seems like when you think about your talent life cycle and your global talent ecosystem holistically, and you think about the need to attract and retain the right people, you've got to look in a you know 360 degree. Oh, yeah you know, view and, you know, however you need to, you know, aggregate those insights. And I know a lot of this, but how do you pull all that disparate data together and maybe come up with new insights that one particular, you know, person or small team, you know, may not have, have uncovered. And what are those, do, do a collection of weak signals amount to a stronger, you know, signal that we actually have to take action upon? Or um, I just think there's so much to pay attention to that you've got to start to pull pull that together, even if the teams are day-to-day -day operating. Yeah, absolutely. And it it's funny because I think within a single team, you have there's the work you have to do, and then there's how you talk about that work. Day-to-day, -day, a lot of times, you just have to do the work. Like, you just have to get it done, whatever it is, like whether it's labor market, internal, external, analytics. Like, so at some point, you're just an HR person doing work. And um, it's, it's a lot more clear. I think it's when we try to, like, look across companies and we try to benchmark and we try to talk about this publicly, that's where people get into these like holy wars over the names of things or, but it, but it is, it's helpful to have common names because you can find each other. And I, I think that's been one of the most difficult things about the, the job market for this space is for people that are trying to break in and say, Hey, I want to do data and I want to do HR. And I know what my company might've called it before, but how do I find those jobs at other companies? I think that's been the most difficult thing is that it creates a real barrier in the labor market. But again, I keep coming back to like giving people some grace on this. I think about HR teams that are hiring their first people analytics person and they don't have the experience of being part of a people analytics team. And now they've got to figure out the name for this thing. And so I think half of that too comes out of that. Just like HR teams are trying their best. They're creating a role that they hope will work to kind of drive things forward. And then again, you kind of figure it out on the ground once you're actually in the company. Right, right. For people who haven't spent a lot of time in uh, either analytics or AI or automation, it, it all just sounds like, you know, magic maybe, or, you know, non-human, you know, things doing stuff like they don't, they're still getting their arms around, you know, what this all means. And, you know, maybe they missed the whole, you know, RPA product process automation kind of wave where we did try to simplify, you know, processes and automate, you know, steps of a workflow and things like that. I do think when we, think about how or what kinds of solutions to deploy against a specific, you know, business opportunity, business challenge, or when we think about how to sort of upskill and reskill people with, um, you know, these days, a lot of it around generative AI, I do think terminology does, does matter because you could wind up spending, spinning your wheels and learning things that you don't necessarily need to know. And I think there's just too much out there to not have some guidance of, sort of what to what to focus on that's relevant to your you know career project you know trajectory your professional development 
um, and the work that you need to get done today and that your manager expects you to get done. Yeah, no, it, it makes a ton of sense. And it, it's funny because the, the generative AI that's come out in the past kind of two years here has such a gravity to it that it's almost like pulled all of the AI conversation into that. And it's funny because like we, we, we've had a, a tool as part of the One Model Toolkit for a long time called One AI, which is this, we've had to start calling it traditional AI sometimes, where the, and which is almost like a funny thing too. There's like, there's old school AI, then there's generative AI or whatever it might be, but it's this like the predictive algorithms, the classification algorithms, these different pieces that didn't quite get into the public imagination in the same way. And that's almost that there's like a more obscure predictive AI that's a little difficult. And once you understand it, there's really powerful things that you can do there. And then the interesting thing I think about generative AI is it's one of the first tools that kind of came with a help manual. Because like you can ask ChatGPT, what is ChatGPT? And it answers you. And it's a, it's a tremendous tool to kind of learn about the space and drive that. What's funny though, is a lot of the legislation is going after both. And I think this has been an interesting thing too, is like, because uh, a lot of people have been doing predictive or classification, especially around things like resumes or ATSs. And they've been getting away with things that maybe they shouldn't be getting away with from an algorithm perspective. And suddenly generative comes out and every legislator is moving. We're going to see some actual legislation come through, regulation come through, and it's going to capture everything because we know it's not going to be specific about that. So I, I think there's been some really nice education in the past couple of years about this whole space. And as much as I would like more name definition, I'm glad that in general, people are like, okay, this is a thing. It's real. It's happening. Let's take care of people in the right way as we're working with these tools. Yeah. No, I've, I've noticed the same thing. And when I started learning and getting deeper into like the, the responsible AI space, especially when it came to like things that are auditable within, you know, talent acquisition, for example, you know, it was interesting sort of balance because yes, I was trying to keep up with everything going on with generative AI, but generative AI, at least at the time, was not the type of AI to your point that was actually subject to an audit. It was something that was doing a stack ranking and it was like probabilistic and it was predictive AI. I don't know if that's you know synonymous with traditional AI, but certainly there was this whole generation, at least one generation of AI. And you know, of course, my my brain immediately goes to, to Watson because I saw I was at IBM when Watson came out of the labs and um, I saw it being developed and I saw all the different you know, capabilities that it had and uh, the APIs that were made available that, that leverage that technology. And so, but you're right, nowadays it's, and responsible AI is a lot more than just, you know, legal, you know, protections and what's auditable. It's, it's the whole, you know, life cycle and being responsible by design. So everyone that touches it and now everyone that uses it is also potentially a builder, you know, building your own custom GPT or you're going into Amazon and using, you know, Party Rock to create your own agent or Microsoft create your own co-pilot, whatever. And so the concept of responsible AI takes on more meaning for more people as more people touch it in, in different ways. But I think one of the things that is important, you know, going back to if this is affecting everyone, how do you sort of upskill yourself and just the things that you need to know, you know, all the, the terminology kind of aside, What's the best way to get this this work done? And maybe it's an actual AI solution. Maybe it's basic, you know, automation, and maybe it's something else. I mean, don't just assume that AI is here and therefore that's my new hammer and everything's a nail, right? So I think just think we've got to temper some expectations, and that's part of making sure that people know what to what to do with it and and when and how to use it. Yeah, and uh, upskilling is a really good conversation too, because I I think there's a lot of people that are feeling worried that they're getting left out. And they, we're at an interesting moment though, that enough is changing fast enough that if you upskilled six months ago, you might be out of date, which is also very tough with how fast this is moving. But I, I think we're at a point where folk in HR, if you haven't been looking at this yet, you really should. And especially when it comes to the kind of like agent-based workflows and how some of the applications are finally coming out that you can start to use. Because at the end of the day, like you don't have to learn how to build an LLM you don't have to learn how to build one of these tools from scratch. You have to learn how to use them. And I, I don't think we were ready to use them uh, before, before pretty recently here. So HR, if you were on the fence or kind of worried about it, I'd say like, hey, it's a good time to start dipping your toe in, uh, start trying to make use of this, start trying to bring it into your day-to-day -day usage because the, the tools are getting strong enough and they're starting to become more available. And um, yeah, it's, it's a good time to start to upskill right now. 
as you talk to companies, are they doing enough to upscale their own workforce? Or are they are they waiting for a strategy? Or are they embracing this? Or do they still are they still not sure how to upscale the workforce? It's a really good question. I think part of my answer is going to be definitely guided by who I talk to. So I, I talk to a lot of people in analytics teams. And I talk pretty specifically to people in analytics teams. It's rare that I actually catch up with an HRVP. And maybe that's something I should reflect on. But I'm thinking about uh, people analytics, I think it's been harder to start to use for direct application because of some of these kind of like hallucinations or guardrails and ethics that need to be put in place. I think some of the, the systems are just getting there. Like we, we've got our, our chatbot in beta. We've got some tools that are rolling out to our users kind of across the one model side. But I think about uh, people in analytics, we still have to do our jobs, which is a lot of this like understand, assess, be thoughtful about and create hypothesis and track what's going on across the workforce. As much as AI is making a difference there, I think we're seeing a little bit more applications in uh, call centers, scaled operations, L&D recruiting, where you see a lot of this like text that was being generated before is now we can move a little bit faster through text or whether that's ingesting and thinking about text or creating text. So I, I think HR teams, uh, it's a good question about how they're doing. I, I've heard a couple of trainers that are, are making hay on this, that they're, they're doing a lot of trainings on how to do generalized AI. I'm a, I'm a little nervous for some of those because there's a, there's a bit of a cottage industry that's really sprung up and it's hard to tell fact from fiction sometimes. But um, I, it's definitely in full swing that people are starting to talk about getting trained. Whether full HR functions are trained somewhere, I think that's a good question still. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think back to some of the programs that IBM had put in place to try to upskill everyone around. What does this AI future really, really mean for us, right? And so we've got to really understand some of the basics, but then how could you put this into practice? And I think, uh, you know, so some of that was, oh, let's let's hear your ideas. And if you think it's something that could turn into something for real, it's not just a pie in the sky thing. I mean, be creative and don't be too, you know, conservative in your assessment let's just let's just hear your ideas and if you think it has legs let's try to put a team around it and build and see if we could build it and then if you do that let's see if we could get some you know we could crowdfund it and then if, it, if we can crowdfund it maybe we can you know put you through a shark tank kind of exercise and then see what comes out the other side but like you've got to experiment and it's not just um, about experimenting as an individual because I feel like that's been a big focus of late of conversations. Like look at our individual, you know, productivity gains and then and just extrapolate that to, you know, if our average consultant is, you know, 30% more productive and we've got a hundred consultants or whatever, look at all the time we've saved or whatever. But I don't know if everyone has really thought enough or has moved up the sort of value curve to look at you know team productivity and and even maybe even looking past productivity right productivity I feel like a lot of that ties to automating things as opposed to augmenting how our brain works either an individual's you know human intelligence or collective intelligence but how do we do more on the value creation side um, in terms of the not just productivity, but how do we make better decisions, I guess, is one way to think about it. How do we inject? Like, how do you really get people to think broader than just elevating the individual? Because it's almost like, and I want to tie this back to what you said before about like workflows and stuff like that. If you add AI to one task, but you leave everything else alone, have you done anything? Uh, have you actually made a significant improvement in that end-to-end -end workflow because now, you know, if one person, if one cog is now moving at 10x, but the other cogs are all moving at the, the original speed, that doesn't sound, it sounds like something's going to break. Yeah, I, I think you're onto something with the individual versus team. And I, what I've been thinking a lot about recently is that uh, the Apple event. So App, Apple announced a lot of new kind of AI overlays and kind of consumer-based AI tools, I think that's going to have a big ripple effect to the workplace because suddenly every worker that has an Apple device has a AI experience that they've had. So whether or not you've gone to ChatGPT or Gemini or these other tools that are out there, 
that was kind of up to chance before, but this sort of rollout that's happening across the consumer experience, we'll definitely see that bleed into work, which says like, well, I can do this on my phone. Why can't I do this with Workday? Or I can do this on my phone. Why can't I do this with Oracle? And um, I think those companies will start to see that pressure from the consumer space towards the kind of HR tech space. It's a really good question though about like kind of team productivity and team connection. If you like swiping, then head over to Substack and search up Work Defined. W-R-K Defined and subscribe to the weekly newsletter. I think you see a little bit of that with some of like the sales enablement solutions, which is also a funny thing. Like people analytics, a lot of times uh, sales enablement stays a little bit separate. Uh, I don't know why that is. And that's something I want to dig in a little bit more because some of the best people analytics projects are around kind of sales and sales understanding, but sometimes sales have their own teams that do that with like, I'm thinking about tools like Gong or um, Hockey Stack or Hockey Stick for uh, marketing, uh, some different like AI enabled workflow kind of in the flow of work of that tech system. I, I think it's another kind of motivation for HR, which is like, hey, if you don't move quick here to understand what's going on and understand your workforce as it relates to the augmentation that's happening, it's gonna start happening in pockets outside of your vision. And so as we think about these different teams, whether that's developer experience or sales enablement or call centers or workforce management that may not sit in HR, they are all getting aggressively interested in this space. And um, if HR doesn't step up to that and say, hey, I I'm gonna lead here, this is who we wanna be, this is where we're going, this is how we're gonna treat our people, uh, I think we've seen historically that business units will run with that too. Yeah. Unlike the workflow stuff, you know, if you're going to make a big impact, you've got to have these, these agents deployed in a logical fashion, maybe even connect to each other. And that may crisscross, you know, different types of solutions. So, you know, you mentioned Apple and then, you know, if someone's bringing their Apple device into, you know, an organization that's, you know, a Microsoft shop and you've got a co-pilot and make, could someone technically build an agent? Well, I know Apple's, you know, still the ink is still wet on the Apple intelligence right. announcements, but um, it just, I started thinking about like, what is, what does this mean? So you've got a team and maybe some of those team members are Apple people and maybe some are Android and then some are on windows laptops and some are on MacBooks. And <laughs> like, how do you, like, will these different agents and co-pilots and GPTs like, Will they be able to talk to each other and connect with each other? It's I mean, I, I don't even know how that would work. Yeah, well, what's, what's coming to mind is actually building on that. It's what I'm grappling with is how this forces us to redesign our understanding of what a worker is and what a workforce is. Because I think workers historically were contained to humans. You can get that kind of like worker to belly button count in the kind of descriptive analytics as much as like RPA was trying, it was it was not quite there in terms of like the sophistication of the technology to really elevate to that disruptive level to what, what does it mean to have a workforce? But as soon as work starts getting done by a lot of these agents and systems and humans kind of augment or they augment humans, whatever it might be, a, a kind of reckoning that HR is going to have to deal with is this sort of who supports work and workers and who makes sure that workers can collaborate. And I see that broadly as worker and not humans, because at the end of the day, like what you're talking about is like, if ChatGPT and Gemini aren't playing nice in the workplace, like how do we make them talk to each other? And like that, right. we, we know how to solve that with people. You sit them down, you coach them and you say, right. play nice and be, be nice to your coworkers. Uh, yeah. but it'll be, it'll be kind of funny to see this like um, agent-based coaching where you're actually coaching the agents maybe. <laughs> I could see someone making a, a really funny comedy about this. Like oh with, yeah, with all our with a bunch of digital sort of digital twins acting like <laughs> cut the, cut this part out. We'll we'll make the screenplay, Bob. We, that's right? that's our next move. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely something there. Back on the um, like the upskilling piece. I mean, I just feel like HR. Uh, we talked about this the other day. Like when we talk about upskilling, you know, we're not we're not asking people to become like data scientists or you know AI software developers or whatever, it, it's, I think it's simpler than that. I think we're, there's so much going on that I feel like there's, everyone's starting to feel overwhelmed and wherever they are in the, you know, AI's coming for my job versus yeah, I can do all these amazing you know, things or somewhere in between. It just seems like to get started and to learn and to be, to get to like an intermediate level 
of working with AI and learning how to use it, like the learning curve is not as drastic as, as some of these other disciplines, right? And so um, I think you made you know, a comment around like HR, like this is a prime opportunity. They're, they're average users and not necessarily the most tech savvy group, but, but you can see so clearly where some of the advantages might be um, on top of the fact that, you know, HR teams, you know, many in HR already think about, you know, compliance and, you know, being human centric and, and things like that. It just seems like there's a really, really amazing opportunity for them to, to start experimenting for, for themselves and then extrapolating the value, uh, you know, to the rest of the organization. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think HR has got a great opportunity to be a leader here, especially because like a lot of the things that happen, like let's take prompt engineering for a second. If you look at like how to write a good prompt, you say like, okay, here's, here's what you're supposed to do. Here's some examples of how, what good looks like. Here's how I want you to respond. And please give me this result or wh whatever it might be. Like a lot of these different prompt guides, as you start to look at them, you start saying, hey, that's actually a really good way to write a job description. If you can tell someone exactly what they're supposed to be doing, if you give them clear guidelines, if you give them clear goals, if you tell them what success looks like, they're going to be really good at their jobs. And so what's funny is actually the, the method of interacting with a lot of these tools is the one that HR is excellent at. HR might be the best in the company in terms of like articulating jobs to humans. And that's really what the LLM needs a lot of the time is that way to articulate what is it you're supposed to do in, in human language, in natural language. And so this ability for HR with, with has that kind of like compliance mindset too and that ethics mindset and the kind of like how do workers kind of get jobs done the upskilling path might be a lot smaller than it was for people analytics. I think this sort of like data mindedness and this data education we've been trying to do and data literacy we've been pushing has been helpful. And a lot of HR has gotten there now, but it was still a, a break from like, hey, my, my core job is working with humans in a very human way. Now I've got to go work with data. This move to AI is going to be very similar interactions almost to what HR has been really good at. So I, I think what's going to be funny is this sort of shift from uh, HR feeling like they've got to somehow upskill in something that it's not who they are to maybe something more natural in terms of the way it interacts. So I, I'm, if anyone's listening to this and hasn't really dipped a toe in yet, like I'm really cheering you on, like go on to ChatGPT, go on to Gemini, go check one of these things out, start to play with it. And I think you're going to be surprised at how quickly you can enable and apply some of the HR skills that you've honed. Yeah, no, that's excellent perspective. I think that, you know, and I don't think there's any one particular role that's necessarily that needs to be like the you know the gatekeepers or the people that sort of turn around and learn it and then turn around and teach the teachers or whatever. I mean I think anyone can step up and and take on that sort of early adopter, even you know, change agent, you know, evangelist kind of role, whether you're an HRBP, which is probably a, a great one, but if you're involved in, in talent acquisition or you talk to hiring managers or um, whatever like you said, I mean, you're having these sort of natural human-like conversations as you as you prompt it and sort of nudge it to get to what you want. Not not in a trying to influence it kind of way, but just in a more in a collaborative. You know, can you help me? You know, assimilate this this information, or can you help me sort of pivot? You know, the way that this job description you know reads to to something else. I don't know. There's a very it's a very natural interaction, just the interface itself, um, that would allow you to, you know, be, be more effective. And I think, um, the quicker you get started, you know, the better off everyone is. Yeah. And I, I think we'd be remiss not to say, like, spend some time upskilling on the limitations too. So like understand what hallucinations mean, how they happen, uh, how to look out for things. I think spending some time to figure out kind of what should be AI and what should be human. Like when, when I think about hallucinations, though, one, one of the funny things, like if you really pressed a human to give you an answer to something they didn't know about, they might make something up. And like very similarly, if you press one of these LLM to do something they don't know, they might make something up. And so even that, I think HR is more accustomed to, like our, our subject matter like is much more fluid and flexible than a lot of other functions in terms of what truth is and how to figure out what truth might be within the business. So I, I think we're, we're primed to kind of look for those kind of like hallucinations and pieces but um, it, it's definitely a like, like educate yourself on some of the risks. I think that's a really big one. And then I, I think where, where HR could really stub a toe, I think, is where if you used it for things that it really shouldn't be used for, 
which is like when like really deep human connection is needed. And I think we have a lot of that in our jobs, which will stop us from being automated uh, for a long time, which I think I'm, I'm grateful for within the HR domain. But that's sort of like, what does human connection mean? What is meaning? What does it mean to have purpose at work? Those things that it's really important to have a human behind it. Uh, keep that in mind as, you, as you're kind of rolling that out. But I, I think as much as you can, pulling in and getting involved is, is a great idea. Just being cautious is still important. Yes, I agree. The hallucinations. I mean, everybody's got a friend who's like this kind of know-it-all, right? So you ask them a question and you don't think they have, they would have the answer, but they gave you something and you're just like, yeah, okay. Well, you're not exactly, you're not a doctor, remember, right? So there's definitely some of that and, and there might be, you know, bias there, just like there's, you know, human, you know, bias in, in the way that we, you know, either choose to give an answer or in, in the way that we answered particular question, um, you know, the appearance of knowledge is not the same as having expertise. So I think using it with a, with a critical eye, you know, it's not a calculator and just really understanding where some of its limitations are, I think is, is important. And that try, ties to some of, um, you know, what we always talk about when we talk about, you know, upscaling, it's not just a matter of writing better prompts or, you know, learning some specific aspects of a different, you know, generative AI tool but understanding that there's there's a we're all when it comes to responsible ad we're we're all responsible and again to your point before this is HR's you know bread and butter is making sure we're making human centric uh, decisions making sure we're making uh, you know keeping fairness in mind and then of course you know transparency and explainability and all those things when you think about just tying that to the the theme. <laughs> of the, the podcast here, when you think about all these things and you think about the concept of an AIQ, what comes to mind when you, when you hear that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think about, you have to know what it can do and what it can't do. I think that that's really important. I think knowing kind of like use cases and then when to stop, we've touched on that a little bit. I think another one we, we didn't touch on quite as much is what goes into it. So I, I think about a, a educational space that uh, I think HR might have avoided for a little while. It's just like, where did your data come from? And what, what does it mean to create data? And what data was fed into this machine? Because there's that sort of, um, I picture like a schoolhouse rock that like, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill, like, and then it walks through how a bill is created. We've got to do that at some point for HR data. And kind of, if you stretch it the whole way back to understand, it's actually like, when somebody said they quit the company, who did they tell? How did that person enter it? Where did they enter it? Where did that data go? Where did it come out? Do we have it out? And then have we actually extracted it, architected it, modeled it, gotten it ready for that AI? That's an education that I think is still coming. But it's something that that, um, that data engineering space, HR is still relatively new to that. But it's an important one for AIQ. And that, I think that's, that's a broader piece around educating yourself around where the data comes from that goes into your AI is important for local decisions around your own company, but also broader ethical decisions around fair use, correct use, copyright, all those things about kind of like the data that actually was used to train this thing. So yeah, I think a, a AIQ also means data awareness and data intelligence in addition to AIQ. No one's put it quite that way before. And you're right. It's not to, again, make everyone that's trying to learn AI be you know data experts, but it's part of taking that critical lens to say, well, just like if you were going to do some root cause analysis of where something went wrong. You've got to go back to, you know, sound, you know, data, you know, practices, good data hygiene, um, and and trustworthy, you know, data because that is, you know, the the fuel for any of these algorithms. And so, again, I'm not saying that people need to add a whole suite of of data uh, courses, but it would definitely be helpful to know, um, you know, through your company or wherever they've sourced data, whether it's from another uh, team inside of the company, or you've sourced, you know, external data, maybe it's, you know, social media data, whatever, what is the provenance of, of that data? Because if your data is suspect, um, and it was, you know, biased from the beginning, then obviously the AI is just going to become, you know, biased based on the historical data that it's collected. Yeah, and it's something I'd say uh, leverage your peers, leverage your communities, and leverage your vendors. Make your vendors work on this too. 
uh, make them explain what's going on, help help kind of reach out and find out what they're doing there. That's something I, I feel a lot of questions about kind of data, AI, and how to get access to data. That's a lot of what we get up to over here. One model is actually unlocking that full power of your, your HR tech stack and data. And so we're, we're always fielding questions and talking to teams about it and trying to share the, share the good word about what's needed to kind of make this happen at scale. Because uh, as a whole, I think, I think maybe that's something that I'd be really excited to share is just from talking to everybody about this, both from the HR tech as well as the practitioner side, everybody is moving forward together. There's a, there's a lot of community involvement on this and excitement around it and what it could mean for the world of work. Uh, so yeah, just to emphasize that, re reach out to your friends, reach out to your community and um, start there before you, you put yourself through a whole bunch of courses. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Do you, um, I know you've done a lot of work to help the community at large around, um, you know, just finding, you know, job opportunities around, you know, people analytics and related areas. And how, how's that going? I mean, I know I see people expressing their gratitude constantly, um, myself included. I just think it's, regardless of what the economic numbers sound like, there's always a lot of, um, you know, transition happening in, in the workforce. And um, I just want to give you an opportunity to sort of, you know, plug how that's that's going and what resources people can. Oh, thank you, Bob. No, really, it's, um, I'm very grateful to One Model that we're, we're able to kind of put that roles page together. And it's something it's it's a way that we give back to the community to say, hey, let's let's make this a little bit easier to get people connected. I think what's really exciting though, and this, this really dovetails into the rest of our conversation, is this this AI boom has led to an AI talent demand. And suddenly the NVIDIA's, Microsoft, Google's, Apple's are are fighting over core talent. But then actually everybody in the Fortune 500 is looking for AI talent right now. And suddenly, if you go back to like, okay, how do I actually find good talent? I have to have a talent intelligence team that knows the market. I have to have really good recruiters who can actually go find that talent and make sure it can land. I have to have a great people analytics team to make sure I can keep that talent. And I need a workforce planning team to actually grow that team over time and make sure I'm making the right decisions from a strategic perspective. I am, I am really hopeful um, that we're gonna see a forecasted kind of wave of an investment in HR around this space. Uh, the demand for AI talent, whether that's upskilling with your L&D team or finding, growing, keeping AI talent that's actually out there in the market today, I, I'd be on the lookout for recruiters right now if I was hiring. If I wanted to get AI talent in six months, you need a recruiter today. Uh, so I, I think there's good news happening across the board, and I'm starting to see little inklings of that in the people analytics board. We're seeing a lot of tech companies start to rehire. We're seeing a couple kind of data science and AI roles start to pop up very specifically. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing more of that from the job board too. Nice. Oh, that's great. When you when you say AI skills or AI talent, I think there's some confusing or nebulous kind of thoughts that enter my mind. Because if when I think about you know low code, no code, anybody can build their own GPT or whatever. I mean, does does that mean I'm if I can do those things? Am I AI talent or are you still looking for a developer who's pivoted yeah. from, you know, COBOL to, uh, you know, working with certain LLMs or, or whatever. So I guess I just want to understand because everyone, you're right. Everyone's looking for AI talent. There've been some headlines recently where people are saying, well, you know, even the concept of a knowledge worker is changing because if I have knowledge at my fingertips now, then aren't I better off hiring somebody who just has good AI related prompting skills and knows, you know, some of this latest and greatest stuff and can learn everything else or knows how to access the knowledge from everywhere else. Uh, isn't that just as valuable as, you know, a Gen Xer like me, who's seen a lot and knows a lot, but you don't need to hire me or. I think there's, there's a really interesting distinction there. When I, when I was saying AI talent, I think what I meant was, that like generating AI toolkits and tooling. So you have a lot of those, like again, like the NVIDIAs, the Googles, the Facebooks that are all fighting over that kind of like someone actually to create this stuff and the researchers around it, like that, that talent pool is so limited. So there's definitely a, a talent war happening there. I think there's another one that's, that's on the horizon, which is this like AI minded or AI literate talent, which is like you can use and deploy and scale operations through the use of AI. And so that would be like, maybe maybe a, a metaphor kind of like, someone's got to build computers and someone's got to use computers. <laughs> you know, it's like you had the IBMs and the, the Intels. 
uh, and someone's actually got to use computers, but then someone's actually got to do the work too. So I, I think we're, we're still going to have a, there's kind of an a open debate I think right now is that sort of like, will the current companies all kind of get upskilled or will we see some revolution in some of the companies that kind of get taken over by maybe AI startups that come out of the blue? And I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about this AI talent war right now is there's a lot of people that still think they can build it in-house and they're going after things that maybe were out of reach before to be competitive. I get it. The podcast just isn't enough. That's all right. Head over to your favorite social app, search up Work Defined, W-R-K Defined, and connect with us. So I'm hearing about teams that are trying to train their own systems or build their own tools or create agents and a lot of things that maybe HR tech was doing before, they're trying to like get started on in-house to see how far they can get. So I, I think maybe it kicks off a little bit of a build versus buy conversation again in a very new way with these new technologies and tools that we just didn't see before. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Cause I do, you know, I look across generations, I guess. I mean, I look at folks like myself, I look at, you know, how my, you know, my retired parents might be, trying to use AI like on their, you know, Apple device or just general, just looking for, you know, help or guidance. But going back to your point, I mean, this, this consumerization of AI in a way does affect organizations, but I also think about the younger generations. Like I, you know, we both have, have kids and other, you know, preparedness for, for the workforce, not just for, for college. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm old enough to have, nieces and nephews, you know, graduating from college and internships and things like that. And like, that's absolutely giving them a leg up if they know that, uh, how to use that stuff. So I think about how you're right. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of analogies that you could, you could come up with. I mean, is it like being a digital native, like use, knowing how to use the internet and, you know, digital tools? Is it, is it like giving them a computer again for the first time? Like, do I actually know uh, this isn't a, you know, this isn't a typewriter, right? Like it's, it's an actual computer. It can do all kinds of things to help you be more efficient. So I do think that whatever your professional pursuits, you're right. There's always going to be people that need to build the foundational, the people that build the car, not just learn how to drive the car. But yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. It's a, it's definitely a tough time though, to be, to be entry level at this moment with or without AI skills there is a tough labor market. I think as a lot of companies are holding off, they're waiting, they're seeing, they're trying to see what they can do with the AI and the agents. And um, e even in Toronto One model, we're, we're seeing some interesting things of that kind of agent-based workflows and some, some announcements coming soon around that because there's, there's some remarkable things you can do to really accelerate what we used to do. And um, I think we, we're just starting to see the tip of that. So even with HR Tech this year, I'm, I'm expecting HR Tech will see some like announcements. Everyone's gonna be talking AI. I know it was skills last year. I, I'd be shocked if we see skills at every booth this year. It's going to be AI the whole way through. But I think it's going to be still people talking about it. I'm, I've got a feeling that 2025 HR tech, we're going to see some really like very new ways of working. That this, this AI ground up rebuild that companies are either working on or they're going to get demolished by these startups that are going after it. Exciting things are going on in the market today. Yeah, I would say AI and skills were the top two topics at, at Unleash and probably at HR Tech last year too. But my observation just, you know, quickly on, on Unleash, I would say 80 to 90% of the conversations that I heard or was part of were about AI, but very few on the, just to tie in the responsible AI piece. People were not generally talking about that unless I personally sort of nudged them in that direction. <laughs> That's but, good, Bob. That's um, good. That's good. It should be pushing them. Someone's got to do it, right? And um, so, yeah, I mean, I know people say, you know, well, that sort of underpins all of this, but like you need to, you really do, you need to be more explicit about that. How are you, where are you getting your data? Are you prepared for an audit if you were subject to one? Are you doing things the right way from, to your point, back from when you, you know, pulled the data together or decided to um, use a particular algorithm or, you know, borrowed snippets of open source you know, code or, you know, you borrowed some well-known methodology. Well, is it proven to be mitigating, you know, bias? Did you transparent in the way you're, you know, analyzing that data and whatever, because once it goes downstream through these agentic workflows and the data and the, 
uh, decisions are flowing to all these other places. Uh, I mean, that, that horse is way out of the barn at that point. And then what are you going to do? So I guess maybe I am the responsible AI police. <laughs> hey, it's, it's, a, it's a good bear to have. Richard, this has been great. How can people uh, get a hold of you? And I'll put in the show notes, you know, your contact info, as well as the link to your um, the job board uh, that you're curating. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, LinkedIn's best. Uh, Richard Rose now, find me on LinkedIn. And then um, onemodel.co. Uh, if you're interested in talking data orchestration, data visualization, data science, uh, come find us. We're, we're always happy to talk people analytics, AI, data. Uh, and I'm always happy to talk about those things too. So Bob, thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Richard. It's been a pleasure. Thanks everyone for joining. Pleasure.